Redding. Welcome to our second in the series of RCTV shows about subjects our community cares about. We, we're calling this Conversations with Candidates because it's March and Election Day, April 3rd, is just around the corner. I'm Linda Phillips, your host. Visiting me today are two candidates who are running for two open seats on the school committee. Welcome, Rebecca Lieberman and Alicia Williams. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you, you for agreeing to participate here tonight. I hope we have fun in the process. So um, to introduce you to the community, because I didn't know either of you really well until just recently that when you were running for school committee. So we'll um, chat a little bit about your background and you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, Rebecca, we'll go with you first. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've lived in Reading, what can you share about your family? Sure. I, first of all, I want to thank you, Linda, for having us and, for our, and to RCTV. Uh, I've lived in Reading for 17 years. I have three kids. Uh, two are in the high school right now, and one graduated college just recently. But they're all veterans of Joshua Eaton, Parker, and, uh, and the, the high school. I work at the Department of Public Health doing research on birth defects, and I hope to bring my expertise with data to the position on the school committee if elected. Um, I have other experience with school issues. I've been a literacy volunteer, budget parent, and I'm a school council member right now. Alicia. Hi, my name. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Alicia Williams, and thank you to RCTV for having us. Um, I have lived in Reading for seven years. I have three small children, ages eight, five, and three. I am currently, uh, have a first grader at Birch Meadow, and I also have uh, two little ones at Rise Preschool. I have been married for 14 years to my husband, Seth, who everyone loves to hear. He works for the Weather Channel. Uh, everyone's really fascinated by that. Um, and he is, um, sorry, I'm having a brain block. Uh, I've also spent a lot of time volunteering for Birch Meadow. I also have volunteered for Reading Recreation for the Father-Daughter Dance and Understanding Disabilities. I really, um, I'm really screwing this up. I'm so sorry. Keep going. Um, I was part of the CPAC for uh, two years, which is the Special Education Parent Advisory Council that worked with the school committee. And um, that's it. Rebecca, can you tell us a little bit about your educational background? Sure. Um, I, uh, I have a master's degree in public health epidemiology, uh, which is uh, big population studies. So it's all working with data, trying to evaluate what is working, what isn't working. And that's where I think I might really be able to make a contribution on the school committee, uh, interpreting those charts they present with the data on them, um, things like that. And also, um, I have a strong belief in education because, uh, because of my dad, who uh, he was very, very big into education. Um, have you been in any volunteer positions in town? I don't think either one of you have been a town meeting member. I've but never can been. Can you share what you've been doing? Sure. I've, been, uh, I've never been a town meeting member, that's true, but uh, I used to do musical theater uh, quite a bit with the Colonial Chorus Players, so some people might remember me, and Susical at the Musical, oh. Joseph, uh, the Music Man, um, a so few we others. So local talent here. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I used to be a library volunteer in town, and uh, I used to drive the books. Um, to uh, homebound elderly, uh -huh. and uh, I really enjoyed that because I really love to read myself, and and it was fun to talk so, books. I'll talk books with anybody. Oh, okay. So you you can start a reading book club if this doesn't work out. Um, Alicia, can you share with us about your education, your background, or your employment history, what you've been doing? Yeah, no, absolutely. I uh, graduated from the UMass uh, Amherst uh, with a degree in communications. And I have worked in the past at ParaXL and Boston Scientific doing clinical trial uh, data collection. And I have also moonlighted for De Cordova Museum, which a lot of people know. Um, I am an event manager at night there, as well as I own my own photography studio here in town. So you have a lot of different sides to your 
yourself as well. I do. So. Um, you, I asked you uh, ladies to give me an idea of what you might talk about just so I could help you have that conversation. And I asked you what, are, what were some of your concerns or your vision for Reading Public Schools because this is a Reading Public School conversation we're going to have tonight. And I will not put my thumb on the scale. This is for you ladies to share with the community uh, about your feelings. You're closer to it. My children have gone now six years ago. And, um, and so, Rebecca, I'll ask you, what was, your, what, what was one of the um, things that motivated you the most to want to run for school committee on your, I know you have a list of more than three, but I thought we'd probably, we'd get to your three and get to her three, and if there's any more, uh, we have time left, we'll get to as many as we can, so why don't you start? Sure. Uh, what I'm about is making sure that there are opportunities for every student in Reading. Uh, I don't believe in closing doors, and I also want to make sure that teachers are the number one priority in school spending. I see my role as making sure that doors are kept open for opportunities so that uh, other Reading students can have the opportunities that my older child had coming through the Reading Public Schools. And, uh, and I don't favor uh, cutting teachers in favor of non-education spending. So that's in a nutshell. And so that's your first thing. I want to keep track so I make sure we get, get to everyone's. Alicia, what's your first uh, uh, concern? One of my uh, first concerns is definitely uh, special education. One of the things that I didn't mention earlier is that I do have a special education child who is enrolled first grade at Birch Meadow. And I am directly affected by what goes on with the budget for both gen ed and special education. So that is definitely one of my concerns. Is there anything in your mind that particularly stands out, um, one specific issue, or is it anything special education is what you're, you're interested in? Um, I think just as a general uh, generality, I would really like to, to see us focus more on strengthening our programs in district mm -hmm. and really working to make sure that those children on the younger end of the spectrum are really ready to kind of go through Reading. Because uh, if you fail them in the beginning, then when they get to the middle school and the high school, then they're really, they're going to struggle and they're going to end up going out of district. And nobody really wants to send their child out of district if they can be taught in district and stay with their peers in their community. Yeah, yeah, that is a concern that, that parents share for sure. Um, okay, so you're, we had opportunities and special ed. Rebecca, you had uh, two more. and. I'll let you take it away. You said something about accountability and you can explain to us what that means. Oh, sure. Um, well, on the accountability side, we have been implementing so many new initiatives over the last five years and I'm not aware of uh, a lot of assessment of how this is working. I'll give you some examples. We've eliminated the old math pathways and now uh, most middle schoolers in Reading don't get algebra anymore. Uh, these are, uh, this pathway used to be available until just about five years ago and uh, the result was that all students had access to middle school algebra and high school calculus if they wanted it. And now under the new system, uh, algebra is delayed until ninth grade for most students. This is much more restrictive than other districts. We are uh, 58th out of 62 park districts in the state, 58th lowest in percentage of middle school students able to access algebra. And what does this mean? It means that students who want to be our future scientists, engineers, they have to double up on math classes or have other challenges in getting to calculus, which is a normal pathway in most districts. Another new initiative is uh, they uh, just voted to cut middle school foreign language teachers, which means the elimination of the middle school model with uh, middle school foreign language starting in middle school, and then that allows the straight path to AP uh, language in high school, which uh, will no longer be available. Uh, this also eliminates the uh, English block, the extra English mm -hmm. instruction that's so valuable for special education students who rely on that in order to learn langu uh, language skills. And, uh, and this is because of uh, cuts to teachers. 
which uh, that's alarming. And uh, the middle school model has worked so well for years and no, uh, nobody knows anything about assessment of how this new system would work. Um, we've also uh, taken some steps like to implement unproven initiatives like collapsing of the tracks where students who uh, could proceed at a faster pace are combined in the same classrooms with students who uh, need a slower pace. And nobody has asked whether this is working. Are the slower paced students struggling? Are the faster paced students being challenged enough? Um, so Do you know if this is being studied or? Uh, I have asked and I have not, uh, I, as of when I last asked, the answer was no. No one's keeping track of no it? No one's assessing, and that's my wheelhouse. I'm a data person, yeah, and yeah. I would be asking for assessments and results and seeing if this is working and uh, surveying teachers and students. How do they feel about it? Are they getting what they need? Yeah. I want to make sure every student can learn at a pace that's appropriate for them, not drowning, but not bored either. Now, the middle school model, the, the foreign language is 7th and 8th grade, is that correct? That's, That's correct. What my kids and then did. the extra yeah. English block is in 6th, six, six. but many special education students continue to use the foreign language time for, uh, for extra, extra, extra uh, uh, um, core center. subjects yeah. so that they don't have to be pulled out of their regular, of, classes. Of their regular yeah. classes. Exactly. Okay, sounds like you, you've got accountability. Um, your second thing, Alicia, you had uh, accountability as well. I but, did, uh, but actually, can I can I just say I actually would rather talk about communication. Okay. Would that be okay? Oh, you can talk about whatever you want. Because uh, I was sitting here thinking about it, and one of the big things that I see is um, challenging this district is communication. We have all these venues and avenues that we can communicate with our district, but we still fall short, and it's really frustrating for parents. One of the things you hear about are the MCAS schedules right now are going out, and with the MCAS schedule, you really want to know when are my kids gonna have to take this test, and some, Parker got their schedule, but the rest of the district only got a range of when the, the schedule would be. And that's really frustrating to parents. And when they changed the curriculum for math and focus, they didn't really give people the, the heads up that they were changing the curriculum until the last minute. And, and that was really frustrating for parents. Um, when we announced staff leaving, an example would be the assistant superintendent. The only way you really had first heard about it was either A, through the rumor mill, or B, through um, the packet that nobody really reads unless it gets posted. <laughs> so, <laughs> unless it's a few, yeah. You know, and I, and I really think that that's one of the challenges with our district. We need to find an avenue that everybody in the district knows we are going to communicate through this avenue, whether it be Twitter, the blog, or email. But parents need to know this is where you get the information. We can't or rely. Or the same on all three venues. Absolutely. Yeah. We yeah. can't rely on Facebook anymore as a district. We need to hear it from the district and, and get people off Facebook and, and into our, we have the portal, which I, I, don't, I don't personally use it. I have a first grader. I've never used the portal. I've never logged in. I'm not really sure what the portal is for, so. That sounds uh, interesting. Um, and you had communications on yours as well, so why I don't you did. give us your I, I on it. second the, the communication piece. Uh, if you want examples, uh, we've been rolling out these new initiatives without telling people about them. I first learned about the uh, collapsing of the tracks initiative because I was a budget parent, and it was inside a budget document saying that because of budget issues, uh, we are going to combine the levels. And that was the first time you heard that was the that? first time I heard that okay. it was happening. It, this had actually been tried back in 2013, and there was no communication about it then either. I heard a rumor about it, and then a neighbor uh, asked me if I would ask because I said I was going to the school committee to ask about math. and. Uh, and I said, I'll ask, and I asked, and the answer was yes, they were doing it. And this was in June. And I said, is any email going to go out? And the answer was June, when June it's of 2013. It was August. for the following fall. Oh, so okay. my friend is a class of 2017 parent, and those kids had already picked their classes for the high school. And then all of a sudden the classes were going to change. No email had gone out, so then they did, uh, 
a letter from the principal came out two weeks later. Wait a minute, just so I understand this. They had already picked their classes. That's right. And then, and the, then the change the selection happens. selection dwindled mm -hmm. and the change That's came right. about. And so if you had already chosen oh, wow. college okay. prep level Spanish, uh, that would have been gone. It would have been combined with the strong college prep. So the classes they signed up for were no longer there. Oh, okay. And uh, then an email did go out eventually but um, there was an outcry and they walked it back, but then it reappeared five years, four years later, buried in a budget document, so. So, um, is there a problem with parents being involved? Are parents, inv I, I don't know, I'm asking you ladies, are parents involved in curriculum decisions? Are parents involved in, um, you know, in subcommittee meeting groups for picking assistant superintendent or high, sc high school principal or middle yeah. school principal? Is, is there any there kind is of community outreach for input from the community or is this strictly administration picks? And no, not, not always. I mean, there are certain probably avenues that they do pick with the curriculum. The assistant superintendent's very involved in picking the curriculum. Yeah. Uh, with the principal, I was actually on the Birch Meadow principal search when they hired Julia Hendricks. Um, and it was a, it's a nice process to go through as a parent to be mm -hmm. involved in that process. And, and even though the superintendent has dwindled down, you know, here are the resumes we're gonna look at, uh, the parents do get an input. And if you really yeah. dislike someone, they, they really will take your, your feedback. So there is, there is involvement in, in that. With reason and feedback. Y absolutely, and you know. That's valuable to the community then. Absolutely, and it, just, it does pay to get involved. It really, it really does. You learn a lot by getting involved in the process. Um, but speaking of the assistant superintendent opening, um, the email uh, with a survey about what people were looking for in the assistant superintendent, you remember this? Uh, it came out oh, 24 yeah. hours, maybe 25 hours before it was due. And uh, so that didn't give a lot of time. So, uh, so then uh, they did extend the deadline. So the deadline is now tomorrow, so if anybody is watching. Um, uh, March 9th is now the deadline for the assistant superintendent survey. To give uh, to give feedback. Yeah. To give your feedback. There is a lot of late communication. I really, I kind of have a running joke with friends that at five o'clock on a Friday you get the email from the district and it's usually something that's important that you needed to deal with at three o'clock on a Friday. So. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, it's one of those things. The um, one thing that I would love to do as um, a school committee member is I really would love to see the district work on aligning the schools. Each school in our district has its own culture, but I would all like them to have the same set of rules that they follow. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So they have their cultures that are great and they're indicative of that school, but there should be a policy for the way that communication is put out for each for each school and every school follows that policy. And I, I find that it's different from school to school. Well, isn't there been a concern about curriculum mapping as well, that some schools are ahead of other schools and they're where they are in the curriculum? And um, that, that's been an issue for year, mm -hmm. years. And uh, I think the consistency of the curriculum is also, I think that's what I'm hearing. That, that, uh, that is, is, that's absolutely true. Um, there are no curriculum maps past grade five for uh, English language arts and for math. I have not seen the math through grade five, but uh, they may exist, but certainly nothing past grade five. And this is the what a curriculum map uh, is, uh, uh, mentions, uh, includes what topics. Um, are going to be taught and then there it's supposed to go hand in hand with pacing guides so you know where you're supposed to be at a certain point in the year so that one school isn't three months ahead in math uh, from another school and that caused a big problem it turned out at Joshua Eaton they weren't teaching math on Wednesdays for a period of time oh, um, yes, do you I remember, remember that? that I do remember yeah that. Um, we were at Joshua uh, Eaton we were at Barrows but I remember yeah that. so uh, that's how that can happen because if everyone isn't on the same page, uh, and it didn't come to light for a long time, but if they'd had the pacing guides, they would have 
someone hopefully would have noticed that uh, wasn't it the was it the MCAS test scores that came out yes so there was a lack yes. and we said why is there a lack and that was the learning? initial oh, we're not doing it on Wednesday. I think that was around the time that Joshua Eaton became level three so people started to take a hard look at what was going on there but um, the whole point of monitoring uh, uh, assessing periodically is so you don't get to the point of a disaster before you notice something. Right, right. A mess, yeah. One of the things that I actually was surprised to find out on Monday night at the school committee meeting is uh, Joshua Eaton is working really um, hard on an improvement plan and one of the things they did is they have the Fontanus and Panella uh, rating scale and they're on the third edition and I actually asked the question uh, is everybody in the district on the same edition and I, I found out that no they're not the the rest of the districts on the second edition so I would love to see that all get fixed as well all at the literally the same page yeah literally, literally the same page literally the same page so that the rating scales across the district are all all the same well I think some of the folks watching are going to know the ins and outs and their personal experience with what you ladies are speaking to but some of uh, other folks who aren't really tuned into school issues, th there's a wealth of information out there. It's digging it out and finding it that, that's really quite an adventure sometimes. A little treasure hunt here and a little <laughs> research there. And Some of you ladies, I'll tell you on Facebook, you have a lot of admirers for the information that you, that you uh, provide and help each other and really get to some of the issues that, that are going on right at the the pulse of the moment and that's so important and it's so great to see parents so really tuned in and other parents you know you're all together and you really want to make things better for Reading Public School children Absolutely. for the district and for the community because Reading Public Schools spends two-thirds of the town's budget right. and um, there's a lot of accountability within that spending as well. One, one thing I want to tell you, Linda, that I think is really unique about both Rebecca and I running for school committee is that I have the K through two right now and the elementary level school, and Rebecca has the high school perspective. So we, we bring the perspective of parents who are actually, we have boots on the ground in the schools right now. We know what's going on, and I really think that's going to be really beneficial to the community. So you've got early childhood I do. issues. You, you've got the academic and the curriculum core in the in the um, older schools, that's quite a quite a um, pair you make together in your in your uh, expertise area. And something that nobody on the board has that I have is that I have both a typical two typical children and a special ed ch child. So I bring that perspective. And I don't think anyone else has young children no. in in the school, so that is a unique position. And it's, I I have. Um, I have experience, I don't know, I don't think anyone else on the school committee has this either, any current members. Um, I have experience with what the curriculum was until the 2012-13 school year because I have a, a graduate of the RMHS class of 2013. Okay. And I've seen the difference between that her education, education yep. and that of her siblings. How would you rate that difference? Based on your first-hand experience, I don't um, know if I want to know the answer to that question. It's a mode well. Uh, yeah. Well, if she's not happy. You're not going to be yeah. happy. <laughs> well, uh, the math has been a real challenge because uh, uh, it, if you are not one of the 25 percent or fewer students in Reading who is in the top track for math, and you want uh, and you want to get to calculus in high school, the path is very, very difficult. The options are doubling up on math in high school. Can you imagine what, what that would be like for a student who gets math more slowly? That would be an incredible obstacle. And so I've seen uh, my son's peers who I know they would, have, if, they would have gone to calculus if there had been a straight path to do that. And uh, as it was, uh, there were some options offered to the class of 2018 that are no and 2017 that aren't available anymore. Some of you might have heard of summer geometry. Those are all gone. So uh, there is a new pathway um, in the most recent program of studies, but I have heard no communication about it. I don't know what's in there, and um, to my knowledge, we don't have curriculum maps. So 
I don't know if it's a good option or not. Um, what it covers, what it might not cover compared with the two full math courses. So your, your forte is your background and knowledge in math. There's a lot of, um, I wouldn't say pressure, but there's a lot of impetus uh, in the state and, and at the federal level to increase uh, science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM core, exactly. they call it. And Reading had made quite a commitment to that. And it sounds like that commitment's either wavering or, or is this a case of budget issues that, that is causing. I don't hear that being said that it's budget issues why the you know the tracks have collapsed or whatever i know there's been reductions at the high school um, last year and uh, i think this year as well a few positions but i'm not sure they were math i i don't know what positions they were you on the inside would know but um the math was what's, not what's rolled the issue out behind behind that the math was not rolled out for budget issues it was rolled out in conjunction with the common core initiative Okay. Nobody says the word Common Core anymore, but... Well, um, it's not... <laughs> it's by the wayside, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, but we implemented it in such a way that... Uh, and, and if you look at the state curriculum frameworks, that is what it is. But my, my take on the curriculum frameworks is they're meant to be a minimum, not a ceiling. Right. So uh, yeah. you shouldn't yeah, prevent right. kids from uh, rising... Uh, so as high as they can level. go yeah. uh, uh, and so I have been uh, pleading for a, a restoration of the pathway that used to exist it used to be that the top track kids would get algebra in seventh grade and uh, the uh, other students would get algebra in eighth grade and both of those allowed for a straight path to calculus in either 11th for the top students who can move very very fast and, uh, and in 12th grade for other students, if they wanted that option. I, I don't believe in closing doors, so yeah, I, it, it's not for everyone, uh, but you wanna have the option. Likewise with foreign language, if you take away the seventh and eighth grade um, middle school foreign language, which counts as one year of high school Spanish or French, then uh, that cuts off the path to AP in senior year. And now I'm very sad about that. There was that. some mention uh, uh, in the uh, balanced budget that the virtual high school, I think you mentioned that, either you mentioned it to me or you mentioned it earlier. Was that an avenue for um, the, was that a backup plan for these extra science math courses? Was that, a, was math a course that was offered within that virtual plan? It was a $50,000 cost to the district. If I remember correctly, there was only 18 or 23 students who utilized it. Um, don't quote me, but I heard that in a meeting. I Do would, you know? I would, I would say that people didn't know about it. There was a lot of people about that- About the virtual school? A lot of people didn't know about it until it got cut. So I wonder how anyone utilized it if it wasn't well yeah, known. Yeah, I don't know. The high school is not my forte. I lean on Rebecca for information about the high school. So your so students you didn't know you don't know or didn't know that any students or were aware that any students were using the virtual high school. Oh my as son, a way of my son is using virtual high school oh. with all the teacher cuts. Virtual high school had become more important. They more they too. offer fewer sections of each class, okay. and so if the one section of a course you want to take is not available uh, based on your schedule. Uh, then virtual high school is one way to do it. I've also heard that it helps students transitioning back in if they're out for uh, health issues, yeah. uh, anxiety, um, that they can take some of the health uh, courses on, uh, via virtual high school and it can help them transition back in more easily. Into classroom work. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting you mentioned that because my neighbor is a, is a virtual teacher Oh, yeah. He actually used to teach in Reading, and he um, does other things, but he uh, he's uh, quite adept at the virtual world, and he enjoys uh, participating with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, did we get through your three things? I think so. I, the accountability. Oh, okay. The accountability was the other. I, I kind of went out of order. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Um, 
But definitely the accountability, you know, I really want to bring the, the questions to the table that I feel that sometimes don't get asked um, when, when we're talking about the budget, the who, the what, the where, and looking at better ways to do things is really what I, I want to bring to the table. Now, to be fair and balanced, <laughs> let's talk about some things that are noteworthy or things that are, uh, we're going in the right direction. How about a little bit of good news? Um, I would say things that are working really well in the district, uh, Rise Preschool. It's a fabulous program, and I, I say it time and time again. I have the utmost respect for those teachers, and I really think that the district needs to, to put it under a microscope, figure out what is going on there and, and what can they take and apply across the district. Um, the kids are really happy, and I, I've been through there for five years now, and I don't have a single complaint. Uh, something else that I think is working really well, I think that Joshua Eaton is on a great track to get ahead to, to back to where they need to be in That's the district. Good news. It's that really good, good news. news. So they have a plan. They have a plan. Um, we have fabulous teachers in this district, and I, I don't think they get enough praise, to be honest with you. Uh, we, I know my own child has a great teacher over at Birch Meadows. I've seen her do amazing work with kids who were absolutely nonverbal and turn them around, and they're now speaking sentences. And um, I think she's rare. She's a sped teacher. She's a sped teacher. Okay, she's in the compass. <laughs> no, she's uh, she's in the uh, compass program over at first okay, grade. And that's sped in in district. In program. district, and she really does make a difference in these kids' lives. So uh, that's going really well. That's good to hear. Rebecca, you you got some. I I love the middle school model. The way uh, the extra English and the uh, and the foreign language, the excitement that that generates. Uh, the kids are so excited. Are you going to take French? Are you going to take Spanish? And uh, and my son's a product of that and wrote the most beautiful letter in support of the foreign language teachers. And they were quite like, remarkable the way they stood up to the microphone and spoke about their love of um, foreign language and what it meeting. meant to them. Yeah, yeah that, yes. that was quite remarkable. And I have to second, Alicia, the teachers. Uh, there have been some unbelievable teachers that my yeah, children have had. You just wrote a letter in the newspaper? I did. Oh. I did. Supporting the teachers. And, um, and I'm still hoping that we'll find a way. Um, I, obviously, I hope the override passes. Um, you agree on that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We are in desperate need. Uh, but whatever happens with the override, even if it passes, I still think we need to uh, spend our money wisely and protect the teachers in the budget. They should be off the table for cuts, uh, except as an absolute last resort. We've always felt, we've always, we are in agreement on that for sure. Um, would you like to expound, was there something else you ladies want to say? You want to talk to what you agree to? I mean, are you part? You par are you partners in this together? We we balance uh, each other really well, so we sort of have have uh, kind of teamed up. I mean, we're not officially teamed up, but we are definitely uh, working sort of together. We do coffees together, so I think that's fair to say, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we. I think if we both were elected onto the board, I think it would really it would really make a difference between her experience and and the high school level and my experience you know, through RISE and K and two, through two, it's, it would be really amazing. Are we, is there anything else you'd like to say? We're down to our final minutes here. We've done well. Um, not that I can think of. Well, I just uh, want to make sure that students have everything they need and that uh, we are protecting our teachers. Um, that's, just well, been a goal of mine and and you want to ask people to vote for you I would imagine oh absolutely <laughs> actually one thing I was gonna say is that if I am elected I really want to take a look at the budget and really find other ways other than cutting teachers I I promise to leave no stone unturned and really you know our our numbers for the number of students in Reading have gone down but our budget continues to go up and that concerns me a little bit and I want to figure out the the, the reasons behind that. The end all and be all. Yeah, so and I definitely know, would. And you want to know SPED inside out, the budget inside out. Absolutely. You're absolutely. not going to have time for much, much else. Right. 
And well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank both of you ladies for coming, for um, volunteering for public office. That's quite, a, that's quite a commitment you're willing to make for putting yourselves out there and for sharing your views, concerns, opinions. And I know you'll continue to do that until Election Day, April 3rd. We're reminding people to make sure you get out and vote on April 3rd. It's a very important election. We have Board of Selectmen candidates to select, school committee candidates to select, and there's a very important uh, ballot question that Reading residents need to consider, and that is for a $4.15 million override question. However way you vote, get to the ballot box. If you can't be there April 3rd, go to the town clerk's office and get a get a absentee ballot and make sure your vote counts. We've had close margins here in Reading on uh, personnel races and uh, on other issues, so make sure your voice gets heard. Thank you again for Thank coming. You. I appreciate it. We hope you've all found this interesting and helpful. Remember, um, <clears throat> let's remember again to vote on that day, and we're asking you to also look for our other show on, with a Board of Selectmen candidate, John Arena. So we'd like to say thank you very much for spending your time with us. Thanks for watching. And we'll say goodbye, Reading, until the next time. Thanks for having us. Thank you.